All righty. Good afternoon and um, welcome to panel five, social, behavioral, and biomedical transgender research needs and challenges. Welcome. Can I have the first slide up, please? All right, I will just be staring. So again, welcome to this uh, panel, um, Social, Behavioral, and Biomedical Transgender Research Needs and Challenges. My name is Jeremy Sugarman, and I'm the uh, moderator for the session. Uh, these are some of the required uh, slides related to content and um, disclosures. So as you're probably all well aware, there's a lot of awareness lo lately about transgender issues. If you look on television, you see Orange is the New Black featuring very powerful transgender uh, actor. You see Transparent winning awards for, for the ability to put that on. Uh, films, we saw early on The Crying Game. One of my favorites, Adventures of Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. I was on sabbatical in Australia, and I got to tell you, it, it was a great preparation film for understanding what I was going to encounter. Um, the Danish Girl, another powerful um, narrative and film. And in the news, we heard of Caitlyn Jenner, and we've also had news about things like public restrooms. So transgender issues aren't just hidden anymore, they're here, which is a fantastic opportunity to make known the needs for research among transgendered persons. The rationale for this panel session is it's a timely topic. There is increased public awareness, and there's also increased research activity. But there are also a bunch of related ethical issues related to research and treatment. There are difficulties encountered in daily lives of some transgender people, and there are also amazing research opportunities and challenges to make their lives better. IRBs need to be positioned to review this work, but perhaps not surprisingly, having not seen it before, they may lack familiarity with some of the transgender-specific issues that are really important to understanding in a robust way what the challenges are as a research activity, as a human activity. And um, there's sometimes some very confounding social and research risks, which are really important to incorporate in those deliberations. Now, in terms of terminology, there's a lot to learn, and the terminology is evolving and changing. Um, in the first presentation, Dr. Cahill is going to introduce some of the terms that we need to use, but there's also a longer glossary for you to use during the session and also when you go back to your places of work to be able to understand the sometimes complicated language that's very important for understanding what's actually happening. You can also identify that on your conference app if you're so savvy. And We'll pretend if you're looking at your app, you're looking at your glossary instead of your Facebook page or you know, your email or something. So here's the plan. First presentation, in addition to discussing some of the terminology, is to look at the immediate sort of health issues affecting transgender people and the need for more research. And then we'll talk about um, perceived barriers to HIV prevention services among transgender youth and the ethical challenges relating to conducting this kind of research. We'll then have time for questions and answers, and the question and answers can also be posed by those of you who are joining us virtually. So type those things in, and I'll, when I'm looking at the monitor, that's what I'll be looking at. So uh, our first presenter will be um, Dr. Sean Cahill. He's the Director of Health Policy Research at the Fenway Institute in Boston. He's Affiliate Associate Clinical Professor, a visiting scholar in the Department of Health Sciences, the Bouvet School of Health Sciences at Northeastern University. <clears throat> Celia Fisher was on your program. You don't see her up here, and I'll get to that in a minute. Celia was the instigator of this session um, based on conversations that happened at last year's AER. She's a Marie Ward Doty University Chair in Ethics, the professor, a professor of psychology, director of the Center for Ethics Education, director of the HIV and Drug Abuse Prevention Research Ethics Training Institute, they call it READY, it's a good one, at Fordham University in New York. Unfortunately, here is what happened to Celia. So with her permission, I'm showing you her with her leg cast on. So she decided not to engage in the excitement of battling the airlines to get here. 
Um, but fortunately, she sent one of the members of her team, Rima Jabbar, who's a program administrator at Fordham University HIV and Drug Abuse Research Ethics Training Institute, ready, got it, okay, more terminology. And um, Rima is the editor-in-chief of the Center for Ethics Education, Ethics and Society, and she will give the presentation that Celia had originally planned to do. Also um, not present is um, Dr. Marco Hidalgo. Uh, he had some family issues which came up just this past week as well. Um, and so he's unable to join us, but since you may be wondering, he's a child and adolescent psychologist. He co-established the Lurie Children's Gender Sex Development Program, and his research is related to the development and psychosocial health in trans LB LGBTQ plus positive youth HIV prevention and trauma. So um, Marco was, and Celia were very involved in the um, development of this panel, discussions about it, and we did a lot of juggling um, to make it happen for you today. I'm sure you won't get be disappointed, and so what each speaker is going to have is about 25 minutes instead of the other way around, and then questions and answers. So uh, thank you for joining us, and we'll just turn it over to Dr. Cahill. Thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, let's see. Can we have uh, Sean Cahill's presentation, please? Um, so while we're waiting for that, I'll just mention, I work at the Fenway Institute at Fenway Health in Boston. Uh, we're a research institute. We're part of a federally qualified health center. We um, provide care to everyone, but about half of our patients are LGBT. Half of our 30,000 patients are LGBT, and about 2,500 are transgender. And the Fenway Institute is the research, education, and training, and policy arm of Fenway Health. So we have a lot of great resources on our website, uh, particularly aimed at healthcare providers to um, help them provide affirming, culturally competent care to LGBT patients. But they might be useful if you're trying to sort of get up to speed on transgender issues as well. Uh, let's see. Uh, so actually, I have a printout, so I'm OK. Um, so what I'm going to do today is um, I don't have any uh, conflicts. Um, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, understanding health disparities affecting transgender people, um, some information on demographics, uh, understanding the role of social determinants of health, um, like poverty and unemployment and violence victimization, and also um, give some examples of um, best practices for conducting research with transgender people based on a couple of studies that I've been involved with at the Fenway Institute um, uh, involving transgender uh, people, transgender youth, I think, both, both instances. Uh, OK, so that's my outline. And um, You're working. Now, now they're uh, synchronized. OK, so gender identity and expression. Gender identity refers to a person's internal sense of their gender. Do I consider myself male, female, both, neither? So we all have a gender identity. Um, most of us don't think about it too much because it doesn't, it's not different from the sex we were assigned at birth. Um, so that's gender identity. Gender expression refers to how one expresses themselves or presents themselves through their behavior, mannerisms, speech patterns, dress, and hairstyles. This may be on a spectrum. It's very culturally contingent. Um, you know, things that might mean that you're you know, gay in one culture don't mean that you're gay in another culture, like two men holding hands. Um, so gender is a complex thing, uh, and gender expression is an element of um, transgender um, uh, identity. Um, so transgender people are people whose gender identity is not congruent with the assigned sex at birth. Some alternative terminology that you might come across include transgender woman, trans woman, male to female person. Uh, transgender man, trans man, female to male person. Uh, we also hear of people referred to as on the trans feminine spectrum, the trans masculine spectrum. The language is always changing. Um, and um, you should do your best to try to keep up with it, but also realize that you're going to make mistakes and not worry too much about it. Um, and if you do make a mistake, just you know try to do better in the future. Um, a lot of young people in particular are identifying about uh, identifying as non-binary or gender queer. Um, in other words, they're not identifying as male or female, but as sort of on the spectrum in between, or as you know, transcending gender or post-gender. So gender identity is increasingly described as being on a spectrum, much like sexuality is on a spectrum. 
Um, so just to review some terminology, um, sexual orientation refers to um, sexual identity, behavior, and attraction. How you identify your sexuality, uh, who, with, with whom you have sex, and to whom you're attracted. Um, gender identity is a related concept, but a different concept. And gender identity tells you what your internal sense tells you your gender is. Sex refers to the presence of specific anatomy. So we also refer to this as assigned sex at birth. Um, and gender expression is how you present your gender to society through clothing, mannerisms, and so on. So what percentage of the population is transgender? Uh, until recently, we didn't have really good data, but now we have a lot better data. The Williams Institute is a research institute at UCLA Law School, which has done a lot of good analysis of existing data sets like the Behavioral Risk Factor Survey, which almost all states do, and many states ask about uh, transgender status or gender identity. <clears throat> and they found that if you pool um, states together, about six-tenths of 1% of adults in the United States identify as transgender. That's 1.4 million people. So here in Texas, it's about two-thirds of 1% identify as transgender. Where I'm from in Massachusetts, it's four-tenths of 1%. Um, younger people are more likely than older people to identify as transgender. That's also true of gay, lesbian, and bisexual identity. Um, so in Massachusetts, where we're, we were the first state to ask about transgender status on our Youth Risk Behavior Survey, which is a survey of high school students, 2% uh, of high school students identify as transgender in Massachusetts, which is very high. Um, transgender people live everywhere. So we're in a very red state, maybe in a blue city in a red state. But even in Texas, there's a significant percentage of the population that's transgender. Same in the Deep South, same throughout the country, the Midwest, the Rocky Mountain states, not just the coastal um, progressive states like New York and California. Um, a little bit about health disparities affecting this population. There's limited research and there are major gaps in the research, but we do know a few things. So we know that transgender women are at high risk of HIV, higher than the rest of the population. Um, they're also at high risk of other sexually transmitted infections, and this is especially true of black and Latina transgender women. So we see racial disparities within the HIV epidemic, um, and we see that with transgender women. Um, transgender women are 49 times more likely to be HIV positive than the general population, with about 19% of trans women living with HIV around the world, uh, based on a paper published in The Lancet a couple of years ago, uh, and about 21%, 22% of transgender women in the US living with HIV. Um, some of the health disparities include um, the use of exogenous hormones, which um, can be very important for transgender people. There's also some risk associated with that, including higher risk of cardiovascular disease. So that's not a reason not to use exogenous hormones, but you may want to just talk to your healthcare provider about other things you can do to reduce your cardiovascular risk to kind of counterbalance um, that, that additional risk of using uh, hormones. Um, there are behavioral risk factors like substance use, tobacco, and alcohol use, which we see in higher uh, prevalence in transgender populations, and those can increase your risk for cardiovascular and other um, health issues. Uh, we see high mental health burden, including depression, social anxiety, serious psychological distress. Um, transgender people are less likely to access uh, preventive health care. This is mostly due to higher rates of poverty, homelessness, unemployment, um, also experiences of discrimination in health care. Um, and uh, for example, uh, transgender people, it's really important for the provider to know if they're treating a transgender patient because, for example, transgender men should be offered a cervical cancer screening, a pap test, um, possibly a breast cancer screening. Uh, transgender women should be offered a prostate exam. Um, and it's important for a provider to know that about the patient that he or she is treating. Um, transgender people often face discrimination in health care. Um, and so this can include rough physical treatment, abusive language, refusal of services, blaming the patient for a health condition that they have. Um, and because of this discrimination, often transgender people don't seek uh, routine and preventive care subsequent to experiencing it, or because they hear that a friend 
uh, has experienced uh, discrimination in a healthcare setting. Lambda Legal is a, a national LGBT uh, legal group that does impact litigation. And it did a study of um, about uh, 6,000 LGBT people around the US and found that 70% um, of transgender patients reported discrimination in healthcare, um, in, including the things listed above there. Uh, we did a study in Massachusetts um, and published it in 2014, and it's available on our website. Um, and we wanted to look at the connection between experiencing discrimination in public accommodations and health. And so what we found is that uh, we surveyed about 450 transgender residents of the state. And you know, with public accommodations, you often hear about public restrooms. That gets a lot of attention. But public uh, restrooms are only one kind of public accommodation. We surveyed people and found that they experienced um, that about two-thirds experienced discrimination in the last year in some kind of public accommodation, including transportation like the bus or the subway, uh, retail stores, restaurants, public gatherings, um, festivals, and so on, uh, and, and in healthcare settings. And people who experienced <laughs> discrimination in public accommodations had twice the rate of adverse physical and mental health uh, symptoms, um, such as headache, upset stomach, pounding heart, um, feeling sad, feeling frustrated, things like that. Those experiencing discrimination in healthcare settings were less likely to seek both emergency care and routine care as a result. Um, we also know that uh, there are a number of us, other social determinants in, of health besides discrimination. So violence victimization is a big one. Um, Half of the, there were 25 LGBT people killed in hate violence homicides in 2012. Half of them were transgender, um, all of them were trans women, and most of them were black trans women. Um, transgender people are twice, two and a half times as likely to experience physical violence at the hands of law enforcement. Um, Anti-transgender hate crimes are often the most violent anti-LGBT hate crimes. And, um, so that's one set of social determinants. Another one is uh, sex work, partly because of um, being kicked out of your home, uh, being homeless, um, not being able to access mainstream employment. A lot of transgender people participate in the under underground economy, and that can include sex work. Um, so 12% in a study of about 28,000 transgender people done across the US in 2015, called the US Transgender Survey. It was done by the National Center for Transgender Equality. It found 12% of transgender respondents reported lifetime sex work, and 9% uh, reported sex work in the last 12 months. And this is just a map showing um, uh, hate crimes laws in the US. Only 15 states actually include gender identity in their hate crime statute. And this came up recently in Wisconsin, where a gender nonconforming youth was killed uh, by a couple of older uh, men who, uh, who um, had propositioned uh, this person for sex and then found out that he was anatomically male and like reacted in a very violent way and beat him to death, apparently. Um, and, but Wisconsin does not have gender identity in its hate crime statute. So the case can't be prosecuted as a hate crime under state law, but it may be prosecuted as a federal law, as a federal hate crime because of um, the fact that gender identity is included in federal hate crimes law. Um, there's just generally widespread victimization and abuse. So this study that I mentioned of 28,000 uh, transgender people a couple years ago found that nearly half reported experiencing verbal harassment in the last year. 9% were physically attacked in the last year. Um, we see about twice the rates of poverty, three times the rate of unemployment. 30% uh, report lifetime homelessness, 12% uh, in the last year. A data point I don't have here is that 10% report being kicked out of their home, the home they grew up in by their parents or a guardian because of their being transgender. Um, and that really has an impact on their life trajectory. 39% um, reported serious psychological distress in the last month compared with only 5% of the US population. And there's nine times the lifetime attempted suicide rate. And this um, victimization is also um, sort of exacerbated by political debates about the basic human rights of transgender people. So this is a sign, or this is a uh, picture from a campaign that was happening in Houston a couple years ago. 
there was a comprehensive non-discrimination law for Houston or Harris County, and um, it covered sexual orientation, gender identity, as well as many other characteristics. And it was put up for a vote, and it was repealed by the voters. Uh, and this was the slogan of the um, uh, anti-transgender forces that put it on the ballot. They said, no men in women's bathrooms. Um, we have an anti-transgender ballot campaign happening in Massachusetts next year, which is, um, may repeal our gender identity and non-discrimination protection. And this has a negative impact on transgender people that we're providing care to or maybe doing research with. And it's important to be aware of how this can affect their sense of safety, their sense of well-being and dignity. We know that transgender people have higher rates of incarceration and also experience higher rates of abuse in prison. Um, so 16% of this national study, actually an earlier version of the survey, which was done in 2011, 2011 um, found that 16% of transgender people reported um, being in jail or prison at some point in their life versus about 3% of the general population. Um, about 35% of transgender people in state and federal prisons and local jails report sexual, sexual victimization while in jail or prison. So they're very vulnerable to sexual abuse as well as just physical abuse in, uh, while incarcerated. And then um, transgender people um, experience uh, a lack of culturally competent and affirming health care. So many transgender people have to explain to their health care providers how to provide transgender health care, what kinds of preventive screenings they need, for example. Um, a third of respondents in the latest transgender survey said they experienced mistreatment in health care in the last year. Uh, as a result, 23% um, didn't see a doctor in the last year because of fear of experienced mistreatment possibly based on prior mistreatment, and a third did not um, see a doctor because they couldn't afford it or didn't have insurance. So the good news is that um, there's a lot of good work happening in the healthcare system, um, in the Veterans Administration uh, health system, um, in the health centers around the country that provide care to 26 million patients. Uh, we're doing a lot of trainings with health centers. This is an example of something we have on our website. Um, we have a project called the National LGBT Health Education Center, and we've been funded by the um, federal government since 2011 to train health centers in how to provide affirming, uh, culturally competent care to LGBT people. So we've done trainings on like working with f uh, migrant farm workers and, and, and um, helping transgender and LGBT uh, farm workers uh, to get affirming care and to provide them with all the screenings they need. Um, so I encourage you to check that out. Um, this is a campaign we did to encourage transgender men to um, get a pap test um, so that they don't um, develop cervical cancer. So I wanted to finish up with um, a couple of stories from research projects that I've been involved with. Um, the first is a project called Developing Prevention Tools with Adolescent MSM and Transgender Youth. So I mentioned that um, transgender women are disproportionately burdened by HIV, um, and this is true of young people in the transgender population. We also know that um, adolescent males who are um, attracted to other males, who are sexually active with other males, and young adult MSM, men who have sex with men, um, are at disproportionate risk for HIV, and that there are racial disparities within the, uh, within the population. Um, so um, we are um, funded by the Centers for Disease Control, Division of Adolescent and School Health, um, and we're partnering with NORC at the University of Chicago uh, and we're doing a project to basically understand how do you do a better job getting HIV prevention information and technology to young people who are gay and bisexual males or transgender youth to help them stay HIV negative, not uh, contract other STIs, um, and, um, and just you know, be happy and healthy. Um, and so we are, um, the NORC folks are doing an online survey, one with young gay and bisexual males, one with um, transgender youth. And we're doing uh, focus groups with young people and then with adults who um, work with youth. Um, so we've actually already done the adult uh, focus groups. Um, we've done them with um, adolescent healthcare providers, with school nurses, with educators, and with uh, youth workers, and learned a lot of inf interesting information. We also scoured the literature and found, for example, that a lot of young people, a lot of young gay, gay males, they're afraid to have a condom in their possession and therefore use condoms because they're afraid their siblings or parents are going to find the condom and then they'll get in trouble because they haven't disclosed to their parent that they're sexually active or that they're gay or bisexual. 
Um, so the, sort of what we're trying to figure out is what do we do with that information to better communicate with young people and with parents and with people who work with youth um, so that more young people are either engaging in low-risk behaviors or are using uh, protection if they're engaging in high-risk behaviors. Um, so we're planning four online asynchronous focus groups um, with youth. Uh, and so asynchronous basically means we're doing, um, we're doing these like over a course of three days and they're kind of like ch chat rooms that are uh, convened for a three-day period. And we're asking young people to come to the chat room several times over the three-day period to answer a battery of questions. Um, we're um, doing this with males attracted to other males, uh, one set of folks groups, and then with transgender youth, the other one. The, the uh, adolescent males, we're um, uh, splitting them into inexperienced and experienced, and that will be with 13 to 18 year olds. Uh, and then we're doing two in-person focus groups with 14 to 17 year olds. Um, and um, these are anonymous, we're using pseudonyms, uh, and um, we're also gonna do two online focus groups with transgender youth. One is gonna be with adolescents and one with young adults. Um, we have received uh, approval from our IRB. Uh, we received approval from the CDC Ethics Review Board and we're awaiting approval from the Office of Management and Budget. Um, we sought and received a waiver of written informed consent, um, arguing that the research involves minimal risk of harm and that the research could not be practically carried out without the waiver. Um, because of concern that seeking parental consent would potentially out gay, bisexual, and transgender youth, we sought and received a waiver of um, parental consent. Um, under uh, this section of um, the continuing funding resolution regulating IRBs, uh, an IRB has the authority to waive parental permission if it determines that a research protocol is designed for conditions or a subject population for which parental or guardian permission is not a reasonable requirement to protect the subjects and that an appropriate mechanism for protecting the children who will participate as research subjects is substituted and that the waiver does not conflict with federal, state, or local law. So we actually um, wanted to do, we partner a lot with some folks in Jackson, Mississippi uh, at the University Medical Center and we've done research there with young adults um, about um, HIV prevention. And um, so we wanted to actually do an adolescent focus groups in Jackson with colleagues there, and, um, but we found out that they have a state law that requires parental consent for any research done with youth. So we just decided not to try to do it there because it would conflict. Um, so we submitted to our IRB that this study is not considered greater than minimal risk. Subjects will participate only in an anonymous one-time focus group. The probability of harm uh, is no greater than that occurring in routine care. We argued that contact, contacting a parent or guardian would constitute a breach of confidentiality for sexually active young men or transgender persons um, who have sex with men or other males and could potentially put some sexual and or gender minority identified youth at risk for abuse or ousting from their home if parents or legal guardians are not aware of their sexual orientation, gender identity, or uh, same-sex behavior. Um, let's see. Yeah, uh, yeah, and we also argued that um, because many parents are not aware of their youth's same-sex attraction or gender identity, um, a requirement for parental permission in this type of study could not only affect the person's willingness to participate, but could also potentially impact the ability of the researchers to engage in this type of HIV-related research with young males attracted to other males and transgender youth. So, you know, I have a lot of colleagues who do, um, and I've done research, with young adults, um, HIV prevention research with young adults, because it's an important population in the HIV epidemic. But um, very few people have done research with adolescents, partly because it's a very hard to reach population and it's a difficult population to do research with. So in some ways, this project is kind of a methodology research project. We're trying to figure out if, we're able, if we can do this. Um, we argued to our IRB that adequate, adequate protection has been substituted by the mechanisms in place to protect the privacy and confidentiality of subjects and by the treatment referrals offered if needed. So I'm just gonna show you some of the um, protections we have. We have a youth community advisory board um, using kind of principles of um, community-based uh, participatory research. Um, we um, have 23 youth who have participated. 
their uh, young gay and bisexual males and transgender youth. Um, GNC stands for gender nonconforming. Um, they provide a lot of input to the research project. Um, we also try to provide them um, professional development opportunities. So we've done a lot of skills build, building with them. We've brought them into the whole research process. How do we do research? How, what's the difference between qualitative and quantitative? Uh, what is CDC Dash? What kind of work do they do? Um, what is survey research? Um, lots of different things. And we recently organized a transgender health conference with uh, Harvard Medical School. And we had about 400 people come to the conference. And two of our youth um, advisory board members were on a panel about transgender youth at that conference. So that's just an example. Uh, we meet at uh, a group called Bagley, the Boston Alliance of GLBT Youth. And the hours of our YCAB overlap with um, the therapist's hours there in case any complicated issues come up or difficult issues. And with, um, at, at the end of the focus group, um, the focus groups that we're going to do hopefully soon, we're offering referral to the Trevor Project helpline, which is a helpline for kids who have suicidal ideation or any kind of self-esteem or anxiety issues related to being LGBT or questioning. And um, we're also mandated reporters if any um, examples of abuse or neglect come up in the focus groups or in the YCAB meetings. And we um, explain that to the youth. Um, the other study I wanted to talk about is uh, a study called Our Health Matters. Um, we published a survey which is available on our website. We surveyed about 300 LGBT youth of color or racial ethnic minority youth in Boston about mental health, risk, and resilience. Um, and, um, but the project, the, the bigger project was called Reducing Health Disparities in LGBTQ Youth of Color. It was funded by National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities, which has been doing a lot of LGBT research in the last few years. Um, it was a community-based participatory research project to identify a health disparity and develop an intervention to address it using principles of positive youth development. So we had a youth advisory board for the project as well as a community advisory board which involved people who worked with youth either in nonprofit social service agencies or uh, state or local government agencies like the foster care agency for our state. The uh, disparities we identified and prioritized as a, as a group, including a lot of community input, were uh, social anxiety and depression. And so we piloted a multi-week intervention that involved mindfulness-based stress reduction and participatory action research with adolescent and young adult um, uh, youth. These research protections that we included uh, were that we screened out youth with serious mental illness, cognitive impairment, current suicidal ideation, and referred them to immediate intensive clinical care. We screened out youth with frequent drug use and unstable stable housing and referred them to services. Uh, for practical reasons, we couldn't see the effect of the intervention, because uh, the intervention was about depression and anxiety. We might not be able to see the effects if somebody was like reporting daily marijuana use, for example. Um, and the unstable housing could affect the ability to participate in the 16-week intervention. Um, during all intervention sessions, we had on-call an on-call behavioral health clinician to provide clinical backup. And we also um, uh, would consult with the clinician if a respondent indicated suicidal ideation in the within the near uh, past. So I went a couple of seconds over, but um, I'm gonna stop now and hand it over to my colleague and then um, we'll take questions at the end. Great, thank you. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Rima. I am uh, giving this presentation on behalf of Celia Fisher of Fordham University on perceived barriers to HIV prevention services among transgender youth. Uh, full disclosure, neither Celia Fisher nor I, oh, sorry. Uh, neither Celia Fisher nor I have conflicts of interest with respect to this activity. You should tell them to put your presentation. They put up Celia. Oh, sorry. Can you please put up the presentations on the screen for Celia Fisher? Good? Okay. So the learning objectives of today's presentations are sexual health disparities amongst transgender youth, methods and ethical challenges in studying sexual health care attitudes and experiences among transgender youth, and facilitators and barriers to affirming sexual health care for transgender youth, as reported by transgender youth. 
Um, in addition to what Sean has already provided in background information, um, I am going to talk about transgender youth and HIV risk. So transgender persons carry a disproportionate burden of HIV infection. The HIV diagnosis of transgender people was more than three times the national average, according to the CDC. And in the same report, of the 2,351 HIV seropositive transgender people in the report, 84% were transgender women and 15 were transgender men. And the estimated HIV prevalence rates of trans feminine and trans masculine ad adolescents and young adults range from 5 to 22%. So based on the data of transgender adults in their 20s and 30s, which make up the majority of transgender data, um, the unique challenges that increase HIV risk include uh, family rejection, dual SGM uh, status-related stigma uh, due to their marginalized identity, lack of sexual health knowledge relevant to their needs, uh, insensitivity, insensitivity and gender bias in healthcare settings, injecting hormones with shared needles in the absence of prescriptions, and concerns regarding interaction of medication with puberty blocking treatment and gender affirming hormone treatment. So they're not totally in sync. Just, yeah. And to date, little is known on uh, whether transgender adolescents experience similar challenges. Okay. Uh, so, trans. Go slower. Okay. <laughs> trans feminine and trans masculine persons are often underrepresented in HIV prevention research. So trans feminine persons are often grouped with and underrepresented in studies of cisgender men who have sex with men. Trans masculine persons are excluded on the erroneous assumption that their sexual relations are with cisgender females. And for adolescents, there are recruitment challenges because of fear guardian permission requirements will out them to parents. And so all of, so because of this underrepresentation in HIV research, there's a lack of sexual health services for transgender youth. Um, so again, based on the transgender adult literature, uh, patient provider communication is pivotal in understanding sexual health risk. So for many transgender youth, a family doctor may be the primary means of receiving informed HIV and STI preventative information and care. Um, however, many pediatricians with, and general practitioners are not trained in discussing, discussing health, sexual health risks with transgender youth. And the intersection between sexual orientation and gender identity can create anticipation of provider SGM stigma that present barriers to discussing sexual health needs. And finally, fear of outing sexual orientation and sexual activity to parents is another concern, especially in light of family health coverage and guardian access to health care records. Uh, the following results uh, about the sexual health care and experiences and attitudes of transgender youth are from a study conducted by Celia Fisher and her colleagues funded by NIMHD. Uh, the, title of the, present, the title of her uh, work was perceived barriers to HIV prevention services among transgender and gender non-binary youth. The questions of the study were, uh, is transgender youth um, anticipation of sexual and gender stigma a barrier to patient provider communication? Is mistrust and confidentiality protections a barrier to patient provider sexual health communications? And what demographic and family variables are associated with the receipt of affirming sexual health care? The recruitment for the study was done as part of a larger study on transgender youth sexual health care and HIV prevention research facilitators and barriers for youth 14 to 21. They were recruited through Facebook posts specifically targeted to transgender youth. And the language of the advertisement was, trans teens let your voice be heard and earn $20 uh, in a study on trans health. Uh, because of regulations of Facebook advertising, uh, the investigators were not able to use the term sexual health, which is why trans health was used. And among several different images, uh, these two images uh, garnered the most attention among trans feminine and trans masculine persons. The inclusion criteria for the study were that participants identified as, trans, as a transgender boy or man, transgender girl or woman, uh, or transgender and in some other way. The uh, participants had to be 14 to 21 and living in the United States. Youth that didn't meet the criteria and all who completed the questionnaire were provided with links to support websites, including this Relay Facebook page, which is a project by um, the Center for Ethics Education of Fordham University. It's updated about four times a day with relevant LGBT news um, and resources. 
So in order for the researchers to include transgender youth affirming survey language, they held focus groups and interviews with transgender youth. They held an, an expert panel of investigative community workers and advocates and resources from Fenway Health. The surveys began with what is your preferred pronoun. It included both open-ended and checklist items describing transgender and sexual orientation identity. So for example, an open-ended question would be how would you describe your transgender and sexual orientation identity? And a checklist was provided and they chose from common terms that best describe these identities. And lastly, transgender respectful terms for sexual contact were used. So one of the most significant challenges of data collections was control for IP address bots. So although survey software um, can filter out repeated IP addresses, it can't filter out bots that are generating unique IP addresses. So to remedy this, investigators um, developed a protocol. So participants who uh, met the inclusion criteria on the screening questionnaire were provided a code number. They were then invited to text the code number and their email address to a secure site monitored by staff for duplication. And non-duplicated responses were sent a link to an informed consent page, which described the purpose of the study. And those who consented by checking a box were then linked to the survey site. To protect privacy, all sites included firewall protections with data encryption, a DHHS of certificate of confidentiality was obtained, and upon survey completions, participants were um, directed to a web page with no links to their individual survey responses to receive a $20 uh, Amazon.com gift certificate. To ensure voluntariness, participants could end their participation at any time and opt out of answering sensitive questions. The Fordham University and Northwestern University IRBs granted a waiver, a waiver of guardian permission for minimal risk anonymous survey research. Uh, the study was composed of 103 transmasculine persons, 93 transfeminine persons, and 32 gender non-binary transgender persons. 43% uh, of the participants were 14 to 17, with the rest being 18 to 21. The average age for um, first identifying as transgender was 13. 87% of participants were white and 41% were full or part-time employed. 68% of participants lived with parents. 79.4 disclosed their transgender identity to their guardian with only 30% of those guardians being accepting. 77% disclosed their sexual orientation identity to the guardian with only 30% of those guardians being accepting. So what's important to note here is that disclosure of transgender or sexual orientation identity does not mean acceptance. Um, when asked about sexual orientation, most participants um, identified as pansexual or queer, and additionally, many participants selected more than one sexual orientation identity. So because of both the non-traditional identities and um, selecting multiple identities, it is challenging for healthcare providers or physicians to understand who patients are having sex with and what their HIV risk is. Uh, when asked about HIV risk attitudes in health services, about half of, par uh, more than half of participants rarely worry about HIV. About a third have been tested for HIV or STIs, and less than half discussed or received HIV or STI prevention um, tools. So what's important here is continual findings in studies, irrespective of risk, show that most sexual gender minority youth do not worry at all about HIV. So 10 items on communications with providers were developed from focus group discussions on fear of sexual gender minority stigma, parental disclosure concerns, and receipt of sexual gender minority sexual health care. A factor analysis yielded three distinct dimensions. Gender and sexual orientation items converged to yield unified dimensions of sexual gender minority stigma, confidentiality concerns, and affirming care. And each of the three scales that were developed had high inter-item reliability. So the first scale uh, was the sexual gender minority stigma scale. It was composed of four va variables and loaded highly with respect to reliability. Overall, this reflected whether or not transgender youth discussed their sexual gender minority status with their healthcare provider, and um, there was very little difference among the variables. Uh, when, when to the item, I do not d discuss my transgender identity and sexual orientation with my doctor because, and so when they answered these questions, um, we it was proven that sexual gender minority stigma was a barrier to patient-provider communication. So overall, 50% of respondents indicated their physician was unaware of their gender identity or sexual orientation and expressed concern that disclosure would result in a lack of acceptance. 
14 to 17 year olds had significantly higher SGM stigma scores than older youth and youth who had received gender-affirming hormone treatment and were out to at least one parent about their gender or sexual orientation identity had lower SGM stigma scores. The second scale was the, parent, the parental disclosure concern scale. It was composed, again, of four variables loaded highly with respect to reliability. Um, this scale reflected that intersectionality of SGM status um, among participants and fear of being outed to parents by healthcare providers. And uh, parental disclosure was shown to be a barrier to patient-provider communication. Over 25% of youth did not ask their doctor for HIV or STI information because of fear the doctor would disclose uh, their confidential information to parents. And younger youth and those who had not disclosed gender identity or sexual orientation to parents had significantly more uh, confidentiality concerns. And transmasculine youth had significantly less confidentiality concerns than transfeminine and gender non-binary participants. The last scale was the affirming uh, care scale. It asked um, whether or not when I go for a medical checkup, my regular pediatrician or family doctor is helpful about sexual issues specifically for um, either transgender individuals or gay, lesbian, or bisexual individuals. Affirming care was shown to be a facilitator to patient and provider communication. So only 25% reported their doctors provided helpful information specific to transgender and LGB sexual health, and youth who had received um, gen uh, gender affirming hormone treatment uh, reported significantly higher levels of affirming care. So what does this all mean? A uh, majority of youth are not receiving HIV or STI prevention services relevant to their gender identity and sexual orientation. And barriers to patient provider sexual health communications include that anticipation that the primary physician will have negative attitudes toward youth, transgender, and sexual identities, and distrust in the patient physician privacy obligations. So recommendations for training for primary care providers of transgender adolescents and young adults include avoid assuming patients are cisgender or heterosexual, recognize and correct implicit or explicit personal and institutional biases, recognize that traditional gender and sexual labels may not apply to transgender youth, and develop transgender youth affirming skills and asking questions regarding gender identity, sexual behaviors, and sexual partners relevant to HIV and STI risk. Uh, become knowledgeable about and be able to deliver adequate services to increase safe sex practices among transgender youth, uh, and directly discuss their commitment to patient confidentiality rights, especially with transgender youth. So to date, there are no evidence-based HIV prevention treatments for transgender youth. Uh, the CDC recommends PrEP for high-risk populations to prevent HIV infection, Young men who have sex with men, bisexual women, and transgender youth ages 13 to 24 comprise the majority of new HIV diagnoses. There are currently no evidence-based HIV programs for sexual gender minority youth under 18. And despite funding, recruitment of transgender youth has been inadequate to generate sufficient sample sizes. So overall, guardian permission is a barrier for research participation by sexual gender minority youth. So institutional review boards um, perceive youth consent vulnerability and um, apply guardian permission, which leads to low recruitment, smaller unrepresentative samples, uh, skewing findings, and overall a lack of evidence-based HIV prevention programs for transgender youth. So uh, fair access is our justice component of the study. So without youth involvement in research evidence-based developmentally appropriate PrEP interventions will continue to be unavailable to transgender youth. So looking at the federal regulations are transgender youth children. The OHRP classifies minors as adults if they have attained their state-defined legal age for consent to treatment or procedures involved in a research study. Most state mature minor laws permit youth independent access to HIV testing and treatment. Some states, like New York, um, permit youth independent access to PrEP if a physician determines their com consent capacity. And despite OHRP approval, some IRBs are reluctant to recognize youth ad as adults um, under federal regulations because the mature minor statutes do not specifically mention research. 
Um, so even if IRBs don't want to classify sex or gender, sexual gender minority youth as adults, subpart D does permit a waiver of guardian consent if um, it is not a reasonable requirement to protect the subjects. So for many sexual gender minority youth, guardian permission may not be a reasonable requirement because it outs youth in ways that are harmful to their well-being. So research has found uh, family rejection and victimization are significant risk factors for depression, suicidal ideation, and sexual risk behavior among sexual gender minority youth. Over half of LGBT youth in a recent study feared punishment or family rejection if their SGM status was revealed through guardian permission HIV prevention research requirements. So for those youth, guardian permission is not a reasonable protection. Uh, I'm going to discuss a waiver of uh, guardian permission using the results of a study, ag again, conducted by Celia Fisher and her colleagues, funded by NIMHD. Participants of the study were 68 sexually active 14 to 17-year-old uh, transgender males and females, and uh, participants were provided description of an HIV prevention adherence study to prep daily pills, pills and responded to web-based survey questions. So to the item, would you participate in a PrEP study if guardian permission is required? 48% of transgender youth ages 14 to 17 would not participate in an, in an HIV prevention study if guardian permission was required. So again, simply being out to parents does not ease concerns, and only those parents who were accepting of their transgender identity were more likely to feel positive about um, getting guardian permission. So IRBs should first consider whether transgender youth recruited for HIV prevention research are children under subpart D. If they are considered children, there is sufficient empirical data suggesting that for a significant percentage of transgender youth, guardian permission is not a reasonable requirement or a reasonable protection. And in addition, the data reported in prior research on youth consent abilities uh, indicate that transgender youth can make a reasoned decision when investigators take an age-appropriate and educative approach. So ways in which investigators can um, enhance youth consent when guardian permission is waived include uh, ensuring that consent is fitted to the developmental and inf informational health and social needs of participants. Informed consent can be enhanced through fact sheets, respectful and learning and caring delivery, welcoming questions, and giving participants time to decide. Consent quizzes should be viewed as educational opportunities, not simply as a means of exclusion. Um, opportunities for youth to share decision-making with parent or other social support should be clear. And finally, a participant advocate can be available to provide appropriate substitute protections. So going back to the justice component, for many transgender youth, guardian permission is not a protection against research risk, and it is a significant barrier to participation in HIV prevention research. Adolescents have the ability to provide an informed choice if the informed consent is tailored to their abilities and support their needs. And as IRBs seek to protect the rights and welfare of transgender youth, we need to reconceptualize access to HIV prevention trials as a critical healthcare right that requires protection against research exclusion. So tying it all in together from research to practice, rigid requirements for guardian permission lead to an absence of evidence-based developmentally appropriate HIV and STI prevention strategies for transgender youth, and part practitioner training will continue to lack the knowledge and skills to provide transgender youth with developmentally appropriate sexual health care, and, and this overall will sustain the sexual health disparities among transgender youth. Uh, the following acknowledge acknowledgments of uh, Celia Fisher are the NIMHD, uh, colleagues Catherine McAball, Adam Freed, and Margaret Desmond, grad assistants, scientific expert panel and youth advisory board, the youth who responded to the surveys, and pioneering investigators. So if you have any questions, please feel free to contact Celia Fisher. Thank you. <laughs> Well, thanks. We have about a little more than 15 minutes for questions and answers. So um, if you do have a question, please come up to one of the mics. And I'll also, I don't have any current um, uh, questions from the people joining us online, but you two are encouraged to, uh, to join us. I won't recognize your handwriting because it's coming in as type. Go ahead. Hi, I'm um, Janet McDowell, and I'm with an IRB in southwestern Virginia. I was just curious if either of you have been involved with research that compares say, provider comfort with discussing HIV and STI prevention strategies with gender-conforming youth 
and gender non-conforming youth. Because in many ways, I could look at those slides and say that describes most of the practitioners I know who deal with adolescents as a group. They don't discuss sexual health. They don't discuss HIV prevention with any of their patients. Right. So are there comparative pieces available? Um, you make a really important point. I don't know of any comparative pieces, but I do know that like with medical providers, doing a sexual history can be really challenging, mm -hmm. you know, and, and um, there's, I've been doing a lot of work promoting um, collection of sexual orientation and gender identity data in healthcare settings, and I know that, so I've done some research on it and a lot of it, uh, trainings on it, and there was a paper published in JAMA Internal Medicine, like in June, and it was a PCORI study of, um, at uh, Johns Hopkins University Hospital in Baltimore and uh, Brigham and Women's in Boston. And what they found was that uh, something like 80% of the providers were worried that if they asked their patients their sexual orientation, they, the patients would be offended. But mm -hmm. only 10% of the patients said they would be offended. Mm -hmm. So there's a real mismatch. In, in that instance, it's collecting, asking questions about sexual identity, sexual behavior. But um, I think it, anything having to do with kind of, you know, sex, uh, the pelvic area, you know, uh, people are just very, and so providers are uh, concerned about it, but other clinical staff, and so it's important to really do role playing and, and, and really train people. And, and I would think it would practice. be a huge challenge to yeah. train providers so you're right. to be it's comfortable bigger, with adolescents. It's a much bigger issue, and we're talking about one population that um, a lot of people just don't know a lot about, and so that's sort of extra challenging, but there's a bigger issue of just anything sexual health related can be challenging. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Jennifer Waldron from the University of Northern Iowa. And my question actually has to do with privacy in terms of recruitment. And so we have a number of studies that are looking to use social media to uh, broaden their sample size and looking for transgender individuals uh, to interview in particular. And one of the concerns that I have is the ability to repost or to out people or to write comments about this particular study. And so I'm just wondering if you have any uh, best practices with using social media as a recruitment tool with this particular population. Did, Rima, did you have anything from your, the study? That way you mentioned the Facebook pro prohibition I, on the one. I'm, I'm sorry, I wouldn't be able to answer that because I was um, giving Celia Fisher's, but I can give you contact information because she did use Facebook advertising for a majority of her transgender use studies. So I'm happy to give you that information. Um, yeah, we, we definitely use social media a lot for um, different studies, and, and we're going to use it for our um, youth um, focus groups when we get approval. Um, and I, th I think also for the um, online surveys that NORC is going to do. Um, I would say, you know, some of the best practices that we have are um, people in the focus groups are anonymized. People are uh, being, we're, we're working with um, an online, for the online focus groups, a company called Inside Heads, um, which, which does the platform. They're going to um, be screening people, um, and then they're going to be assigning people an anonymized name, just like a made-up name. Um, to protect them against any kind of disclosure. Um, we're doing national online focus groups with a small number of people. I think the, the odds of anyone in the focus group being able to identify another person are pretty minimal. I guess the bigger concern is just if other people repost and say, hey, Maria, you identify as trans. Oh, Why don't I you see. participate? Mm. And Maria's parents uh, don't know. And now they oh, see that's... this particular repost, mm -hmm. it, I guess, is more of the concern. Or people start posting inappropriate comments in response to the Facebook ad, right. uh, that sort of thing. Yeah. So, I mean, the inappropriate comments, that could be monitored and they could be deleted. Um, the, the, I mean, that's a really important point that you bring up about reposting and outing somebody that way. And it could be, you know, with no ma malicious intent at all, but just sort of not realizing. I, mean, I think a lot of people post things on Facebook, they have no idea, like, how, you know, it exposes them. But um, so that, that's something that I'll, I'll think about. And maybe we can put some sort of language in there, please do not repost or please share individually, but don't, you know, some, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, very helpful. Over, over here? 
Oh, hi. My name is Elizabeth Muti. I'm from the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston. Uh, I was curious if either of you had any sense of what the rate of uh, where prisons, either state or federal, honor one's gender identity. Um, do they have to be in a certain transition period, or do they have to legally have declared their gender identity uh, when it comes to placing them in an appropriate male or female facility? Right. Um, that's a great question, and it's especially important because with the transgender population, there are higher rates of incarceration um, and high rates of victimization while incarcerated. It's also true for gay and bisexual men. There's like 11 times the rate of uh, sexual assault sure. against gay men in state prisons, 10 times the rate against bisexual males compared to straight males. So it's an important issue. Um, I've actually been doing some work with some colleagues in um, Rhode Island at the Miriam Hospital. They have a th project called the Center for Prisoner Health and Human Rights. and um, We've been working with the National Institute of Corrections and developing best practices for managing LGBT and intersex people in, who are incarcerated, in correction settings is the language they use. So we've developed a best practices document for working with adults and a best practices document for working with youth and juvenile settings. And there are definitely best practices and we're really hoping to get these published soon. Um, so uh, there's, there's a lot of, um, there's a whole sort of body of uh, legal cases. Um, there are, uh, like under the Obama administration, the Department of Justice p made some good decisions, like um, Attorney General Holder, uh, near the end of his tenure as Attorney General, um, talked about the, the fact that transgender women have the right, if they were on hormones before they went into prison, same with transgender men, they have the right to access hormones. That's part of their medically necessary treatment while in prison. It's cruel and unusual to deny that to them. Um, a lot of the work is through the rubric of the Prison Rape Elimination Act, which was passed in 2003, but it took a long time to implement, and so there were some um, implementation regulations just put in place in the last few years. And when a person comes into prison, they're um, asked if they're LGBT or intersex, and they're also, if they, even if they say, that, no, I'm straight, um, cisgender, if, they, if they're in any way kind of like gender variant or effeminate, if they're a guy or Matt, sort of butch, if they're a woman, that's noted and it's meant to be noted in a way that's helpful to the prisoner. And, and the staff, uh, the corrections officers are supposed to keep an eye on that person, make sure they're not being um, singled out for abuse or, you know, because there's a lot of that that happens in prison. Um, so there is some great work happening within the Bureau of Prisons in DOJ. Um, and in prison systems around the country and juvenile systems. Massachusetts, uh, our Department of Youth Services is actually has model policies for the rest of the country. Um, the, and we're, we're gonna try to promote those through the, these uh, best practice documents. Our adult system is not so great. Um, there's a lot of room for improvement with our adult system. Thank you so much. Great. Um, there are no questions um, coming in online. If you have other questions, don't be shy. We've got some time left and we've got some great resources here, so please come up to the microphones. Um, in the meantime, while you're thinking about that question, or you can tell the person next to you to ask the question for you or something, or you can sneak up a little piece of paper and I'll read it for you. I'm not shy, I'm just being recorded, but I'm happy to read them for you. Um, have either of you um, found helpful practices for dealing with IRBs that may be unfamiliar with these sort of challenges? I have no personal experience with IRBs or research practices. So. Okay. Um, you know, in this sort of background section of your proposal, you, also, you always have to explain like why you want to do this research. Um, and I think in, in those sections, you know, having a really good evidence base, citing, you know, peer-reviewed literature, especially more recent literature that sort of talks about the disparities you're trying to um, study and understand and possibly develop an intervention to reduce, that sort of highlights, you know, the, the benefits of the research and, and is important when weighing risk to uh, participants. Okay. You know? Great. Yeah, no, I was struck by um, the, the Celia Rima presentation about how laying out for the, rather than waiting for the IRB to guess, is this research with children, is this adequate protection, that if you actually lay that out for an IRB, um, that can actually be helpful so the IRB can't, doesn't have to guess what you want to do as an investigator. 
And similarly, it helps put the IRB may reject that approach, but it's still, I think, very helpful to an IRB to have this idea that we are specific, although this research uh, deals with uh, people age blank to blank, we do not feel it comports with the regular subpart D because blank. We also don't think blank and just laying it out for the IRB. I know that's been a helpful strategy whenever we're doing um, research that raises questions of um, sex, drugs, or rock and roll. Well, actually, just the first two. Okay. Um, go, yes. Hi. Um, I'm from Pennington Biomedical Center in Baton Rouge. Um, we do research on diabetes, so nothing related to this. But incidentally, if we had someone who came in um, who may have, you know, fallen to uh, also, it's a, conter a conservative state. So, I wanted you talked about a little bit about best practices. I'm wondering how you would approach that, and whether being sensitive to that person and how they would identify as male or female. Uh, it's not something that we sort of think about. So we're not like Massachusetts, where you're kind of on the forefront of that. We're just uh, trying to. Um, it's just incidental that the person came in and they happen to be in this. And also, we have a study that's a DOD study that has um, military base. And so we also want to be very careful with that as well because um, with policies related to, you know, don't ask, don't tell, that kind of thing, um, you know, we want to gather information but we don't want to put that person into any jeopardy. So, okay, so if I, we understand the question correctly, this is great. You're doing a study that's directed at, at diabetes or another condition and one of the participants happens to be a trans person. Is that Correct. right? And so yeah. what you should By appearance, it seems By that appearance. the case. And so we're trying to figure out, you know, issues of confidentiality, making sure that they're not harmed in any way, um, but also to get their information so they also can participate in research. Great. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for the question. It's a really good question. You know, I, I wouldn't assume that diabetes is not relevant to this population, first of all. Um, we know, um, I do work on the LGBT population more broadly, and we see high rates of obesity among lesbian and bisexual women, um, like three times the rate of obesity, um, and that's a risk factor for diabetes. And it's, um, I don't, there's not great data yet, but there could be high rates of obesity, particularly among transgender men. Um, so that's something, I think, a future direction for research. Um, I would say, you know, you wanna be affirming to this individual who's come in and is participating in your research study and is possibly a patient um, at your institution. And we have a lot of materials on our website that could help you with that. It's, it's about using the name the person wants to use, even if it doesn't match their identity documents, even if it doesn't match their insurance card. Um, it's about using the pronouns that they use. That's, that's like 90% of it right there. It's just treating them the way they want to be treated. It's kind of like the golden rule, you know? And, um, and, then, and then just doing your best and having good intentions. I think that's important. Um, Confidentiality. And, and, and then just the other thing about the data, like if you're collecting data in a clinical setting, it is protected by HIPAA. So, you know, the same confidentiality protections would be in place as any other sensitive medical information. So uh, I think that um, maybe somebody else from an IRB could talk about the protections that are in place for, you know, research data. But, um, okay. Yeah. Well, we now have, um, it's great, we have four people standing online. This is awesome. Um, we have about four minutes left. So um, what I'd like to do, if you will, is if you, the four of you could just raise your question, concern, uh, complaint, criticism, suggestion, joke of the week, um, lottery numbers are appreciated. Um, and then we'll um, ask the panelists to respond so we can finish up on time so you can get your um, uh, caffeine if you do that sort of thing. Uh, my name is Brian Jackson. I'm a pediatrician and IRB chair at the University of Colorado. And in working with our researchers who do work with transgender community, um, we discovered some barriers that we had, like having a CRV form that asked for gender um, uh, as one of the demographics that we asked for at each continuing review, and we were able to modify that. My question is if there are other kind of structural or procedural barriers that you've identified in your research that IRBs can change to be more supportive of research involving transgender people. Thank you. Next. Hi, Leah Silbert, Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. Uh, just as I'm hearing you speak, I'm just wondering if there's been any effort to include transgender population as a protected population separately from youth or um, any other 
like prisoners, let's say, um, in the regulation. As a regulatory matter, like another, another subpart. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, Catherine McDougall, Bay State Medical Center in Massachusetts. Uh, on the industry side, just curious if there's any talk about how to handle protocols that have sex-based exclusions, say, a uh, cooperative group, cancer protocols, studying breast cancer, mm -hmm. typically um, excluding men because in cis men, breast cancer is a much smaller uh, part of the population. Okay, another great question. Yes. Ted Marcy, IRB Chair at University of Vermont. Uh, we sometimes are very concerned, perhaps inappropriately, um, that just knowledge that the person is participating in research on a transgender issue outs them. And are concerned then about what's on the information handout that they may take home, or emails, reminders, and such. And I'm wondering if this is an appropriate concern, and if it is, how you might guide us in addressing that. These are all, all great issues, and um, an opportunity to, to probably stimulate some, some great uh, research and pro program ideas. But I'll let you, do, do you want to say on any of those? Sure. Okay. Yes. So we'll uh, let right, Sean uh, um, sweep up. <laughs> So Ryan, structural barriers um, in IRBs. My colleague, uh, Amy ben Aria is here. She runs the Fenway Institute IRB, and she raised a really good point in an earlier session um, that you should look at the language you use in studies. And it kind of relates to the second question, I think, uh, or actually the third question by Kathy from Bay State Medical Center about do you use language that's inclusive? And is, if, you're, if you are doing a study with women, does that include transgender women? or not, and if not, why not? Just sort of thinking kind of critically about the language that you're using. Um, including trans population as a protected population and regulations, I'm not sure if there's efforts to do that, but I do know that NIH designated LGBT people as a disparities population in fall of 2016, and that has some implications for you know, research in general and NIH funded research in general. So that's an important step, I think, toward highlighting the importance of this population in terms of health disparities. Um, and then the, the UVM person, Ted, uh, I would say that um, particularly for youth, we might want to use ambiguous language in, um, you know, in handouts and in uh, advertising to recruit people for a study, kind of like with the Facebook example where you didn't use the word sex, you know, you, use, you said transgender health. health. Yeah. Um, that might be a, a good thing to think about with youth in particular who are very vulnerable. I think with adults, it's, they're, they're not as vulnerable, but certainly like elders could be. Elders who are in a congregate living facility or could have vulnerabilities. So um, it's something definitely to think about, um, I think, going forward. Right. I think these are some great points, and there are some analogous situations which you can learn from. There are some deep concerns about uh, vulnerability among HIV prevention. Uh, research that's been gone on for a while, which you could use similar strategies, at least for protecting study documents and the like. Um, the issue about protection and the regulations is a double-edged uh, uh, question. I don't want to say a sword. And part of the issue is uh, the, each of those sets of subparts was put into place as a protection, which is an admirable concern when there are risks. But what it inadvertently does, as you've seen in the justice argument, is closes off some of the opportunity for the research that's desperately needed. So striking a balance on all of those parts, including prisoners, children, pregnant women, and the like, um, has, has pluses and minuses. And so we want to really think carefully about what kind of protections we can put into place that are appropriate in ensuring that there's good access and fair access. And I'll just finish up with one strategy we've started to do in the HIV Prevention Trials Network is when we're enrolling um, men and transgender uh, women in a study of HIV prevention, we always um, put in the term now cisgender and transgender so that we are normalizing the fact that there may be a descriptor prior to that word. Um, who knows if it does anything in protocols or IRB applications and the like, but it, it, it's meant to be an affirming approach to say that these are, this is all of relevance. Um, I just want to close by saying I'm really thankful to both of you, to the other panelists who couldn't be here for teaching me a lot about 
some of the emerging issues and the changing, changing face of this. And I hope everybody in the room um, got something out of it and something to take away. And it's, a, I hope, the beginning of an important set of conversations. So please join me in thanking the panelists one last time. Thank you, thank you Dr. Sugarman, for your moderation and helping to pull this together.